Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. All right, idiots, I suppose today you want to know about planetary management in Stellaris. Well, sit down, shut up, and listen carefully. I will be assuming you've seen the complete idiot's guide to Stellaris. That's going to have covered all of your basics. If you haven't seen that, I'll put a link down in the description. I'd really recommend you start there before moving on to some of the more complicated topics we'll be covering today. Planetary management has changed quite a bit in Stellaris in the last few years. With that in mind, in today's guide video, we're going to be looking at your capital, how to manage that, your initial colonies and how to manage those, as well as how to manage every other world you get beyond that. Yes, we're basically going to cover the entirety of planetary management. It's going to be a long video, it might be a little arduous because this is sometimes a complicated topic, but we are going to cover all of the bases today. So let's dive in. The first planet you will ever have to manage is your capital. As mentioned before, I have already covered the basics of what everything on this screen and everything on this screen means for your empire. If you don't already know those basics, I do highly, highly recommend you start at the very beginning with the complete idiot's guide to Stellaris and then come back and watch this video. If I still have your attention, you clearly are ready for some more information. So now that we know what all of these different things do, we can start to think about what we should do with them. The designation for your starting world will be Empire Capital unless you're playing with one of the funny hive mind or machine intelligence races. Empire Capital adds plus 5 stability, plus 10 amenities, plus 100% governing ethics attraction, plus 10% resources from jobs, and plus 10% automatic resettlement destination chance. This designation is also immutable. Once you've set your empire's capital, you cannot change the colony designation of this world, and that will have some big effect on what you can actually do with this planet. As we've started with the quick start, just like in the previous video, we will be having a prosperous unification start that will boost our happiness, amenities, and resources from jobs. Now, what do these bonuses really do? So, every point of stability above the base level of 50 adds 0.6% resources from jobs, 0.6% trade value, and some immigration pull. Amenities increase the happiness of our pops. If we go over to the population tab here, we can see the overall pop approval rating of the planet. This is the happiness of each individual pop multiplied by their political power. And that then gives us an average approval rating for the planet. As long as we have a balanced amenity usage, that is our amenity production and our amenity upkeep are equivalent, we should have available amenities of zero. That will have no overall effect on happiness. As you have excess amenities, that will boost the happiness of the pops on your planet and negative amenities reduces it. There's quite a complicated formula for working out how this works, the important thing to know is that these amenities and the excess amenities are scaled by the number of pops on your planet. If your total output of amenities is twice that of your pop amenity usage, you'll get the maximum bonus to citizen happiness, which is plus 20%. If you only have one quarter of the amenities provided as the amenities usage, you will get a maximum decrease to happiness of minus 50%. This then changes the overall pop approval rating of your planet, which then has an impact on stability. Pop approval rating above 50 will positively impact stability and below 50 has a negative impact. This then means that both stability and amenities here basically increase our resources from jobs by an additional amount, which is not trivial to work out. So basically our capital gets some nice bonuses to stability, approval and resources from jobs that our regular colonies won't be getting. So how should we use this on our world? Well, in Stellaris, specialization of your colonies of your planets is a very important and very necessary thing to do. I would actually recommend that you use this specialization to put extra research labs on your capital, as they will benefit the most from these bonuses, because relative to the other bonuses you can get for this category, there is not that much additional use in putting them on a different world somewhere else. I also wouldn't recommend you specialize your capital as an industrial world unless you have the guest out consciousness authority type. Regular empires will get one artisan and one metallurgist job from each industrial district. 
and generally speaking we want to specialize our planets so we would want to be designating a world to be either a metallurgist only world or an artisan only world and that way we can maximize the associated benefits for having just those jobs on our planet. With our capital we can only choose to be an empire capital designation so we cannot shift these jobs from metallurgist into artisan or vice versa. Your capital also starts with a large amount of workers working basic jobs to give you basic resources. It's definitely a good idea to build more of these districts on your capital in the early days of your expansion as your empire capital will be the primary place you go to when you need to produce basic resources. So when you finally save up enough minerals to build your first district or building on your capital, it's a great idea to go ahead and first stabilize your economy somewhat, that is build something like a generator district or a mining district. And if you're enjoying this video, please manage that like button. Now with your capital, you are going to have some unique and interesting problems. The first being that you usually start the game with one of these absolutely despicable commercial zones providing you with a whole bunch of clerk jobs that your pops will be dying to work. And now we're going to have to employ a little bit of pop micromanagement because we really don't want our workers to be working these clerk jobs when they could be working much more productive technician jobs. So we're going to open up the workers tab and then by decreasing the job priority, we can push pops out of working this clerk job and push them into the open technician jobs we now have available. You can also select a single job to take priority. However, that has some mixed results. For example, now when I prioritize technicians, it's automatically moved clerks across, but sometimes the game may decide to move some of your farmers or miners instead, and you really don't want that. By choosing the exact job priority levels, you can have very direct control over which jobs your pops are actually working. But do keep in mind that as new pops are grown, and as new districts and buildings are constructed, you will need to change around these priorities if you want to get the maximum efficiency out of your workers. Now that we've pushed our clerks into working our technician jobs, I'd recommend you start filling your remaining slots with something like research labs. This will boost our research income, which is a very, very important income in Stellaris. Like many 4X games, research is critical to progressing in the game. It's also a great idea when you have the energy credits for it to clear the sprawling slums on your capital. This gives you one pop and for 300 energy credits, that's the best, most efficient and cheapest way you'll ever get a pop in Stellaris. You might also notice we now have some negative amenities from unemploying those clerks. Don't worry about having negative amenities. It's not actually that big a problem. Even if we had a very large negative amenities, as long as our stability doesn't go below 50, we shouldn't be suffering any negative effects from our resource output. Generally speaking, it will be more efficient to employ your pops in production jobs and boost your base income instead of employing them in amenities producing jobs, which will increase the happiness and thus stability, giving a small bonus to each of your workers. You'll also want to keep an eye out for whether or not your pops try and get into this enforcer role. Enforcers are a unique job in Solaris that provide very little except for crime reduction. But it is very important to know that you in essence don't need any crime prevention as long as your crime is below 30. Below 30% crime, it will have simply no effect on your empire, there are no negative events that can happen, and it is basically completely ignorable. Given that enforcers reduce crime by 25, if you have 0 to 5% crime, it therefore becomes a very good idea to actually unemploy this enforcer and either wait for them to demote to a lower role, that being a worker role, or build a building which should provide specialist jobs worthy of their stature. Once you've run out of building space in your capital, as long as your economy is still in a healthy shape, it's probably then a good idea to first replace your commercial zone with a more valuable building, for instance a research lab, before moving on to building city districts which will then open up even more building slots. Something else you should definitely be on the lookout for whilst managing your planets at the start of the game is the hydroponics farming technology. Once you have access to the hydroponics bay technology, this is a great building to put down on your star bases. In fact, I'd actually recommend you build as many star bases as possible and even go one or two star bases over your star base capacity so that you can put down hydroponics bays everywhere in your empire. But why am I doing this? Have I gone mad? No. 
I haven't gone mad. The reason I'm doing this is we can then get rid of our agriculture districts on our capital and re-employ these precious, precious pops to work different jobs. I've actually been able to completely eliminate all of my agriculture districts, instead moving those workers into mining and technician production and still maintained a balanced economy. Because with our food, it only ever acts as a consumption for our pops. Unless we want to sell it for energy credits or trade it with an AI empire, it is basically worthless to us. After your capital, each new colony that you found basically offers you a blank canvas with which you can paint the picture of your empire. When colonies start off, they start with a designation of colony. This increases the stability, amenities, happiness, and automatic resettlement destination chance. But you can, of course, choose to set your colony to a different colony type. And after you reach five pops, this will automatically be done for you as you can no longer be a colony designation when you've got too many population on your planet. Colonies can be specialized in a variety of ways, but it is important to keep in mind the things that you need for the functioning of empire. It's also really important to think about the situation your colony starts in when you set it up. Originally, you only start with the reassembled ship's shelter building. This provides you with some housing, some amenities, a building slot, and two colonist jobs. These colonist jobs are pretty much the worst jobs in the entire game, and for that reason, we want to get rid of them, or at least replace them with something else, as soon as possible. At the very start, our amenity needs will be completely met by this colony designation, so it would be very reasonable to build an additional building on the planet, providing some sort of resource that we need, and hopefully going into the specialization we'd like for this world, and then deprioritize all of our colonists and push them into those jobs instead. In this case, I'm currently running something of a deficit of consumer goods. So on this first world, which is very large in size, I'm probably going to designate it as an industrial world, first focusing on consumer goods. And then when I have a, another world, a smaller world to produce my consumer goods or more colonies that I can spread my consumer good production between, I will specialize it uniquely to be a metallurgist world or a forge world. If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by following the affiliate link down below in the description. Purchasing something from the Humble Bundle store. This includes Stellaris and all of the DLC on offer. If you follow the link and you buy something from the Humble Bundle store, a portion of your purchase will go towards supporting this channel. And now that I've built my civilian industry, I can go to the population tab and completely get rid of these colonists, pushing them over into artisan jobs instead. That has now completely fixed my consumer good consumption, which is pretty high due to the large number of research labs on my capital. I'll then continue down this line of specialization by constructing another district here. In this case, an industrial district. As you pass over the five population mark, if you don't have any colonists employed, you might start to feel something of a bite due to an amenity shortage. Because at this point, your world will have to be specialized as something other than the colony designation. There are two relatively straightforward solutions to this amenities problem that don't require pops. You see, if we got one of our pops to move from one of these jobs to the colonist jobs, we'd actually be reducing our production here by over 20% base. And that is a lot bigger than just this minor minus 5% from jobs. You see, if we expand the specialist tab and we choose one of our pops to look at, we can actually see all of the modifiers that are affecting this pop. We are getting bonuses, not just from our governor, but also from our empire, which changed the output of this pop. So a minus 5% resources from jobs here is in effect a absolute minus 3 to 4%. Whereas if we unemployed one of these artisans and reemployed them as a colonist, that would be an absolute reduction of 20% to our output, which is really dreadful. So the two solutions are first distribute luxury goods that will increase your amenities. And in this case, just a small increase here of 25% will put us up from minus four to minus two, and that's pushed us into positive stability, giving an 8% resources from jobs swing. The other option we can go for, which is definitely useful, is to build a luxury residence. This will provide five amenities, which should stabilize your planet amenity usage until you get up to 10 pops and can then upgrade the planetary administration and get some better pop jobs, which produce unity and amenities. For my second colony, I'm actually going to be specializing this world probably as a research and unity producing world. So first off, I'm going to start with an administrative office. 
And now that I've built my administrative offices, I'll also go and unemploy my colonist jobs and push them into being bureaucrats. Once one of your colonies reaches 10 population, you should immediately, if you can afford it, upgrade the capital building to the next level, the planetary administration. A planetary administration provides more housing and more building slots, along with two politician jobs, which are much better than colonist jobs, as politicians produce both amenities and a large amount of unity, whilst also being part of the ruler strata. And that's important because rulers tend to have a very, very high political power weight, meaning as long as we can keep these two rulers happy, we can keep the overall pop approval rating of this planet very, very high. On this world, we have seven specialists and two rulers, and those two rulers collectively have half the political weight of the entire planet. Meaning, yes, as long as they're happy, stability shouldn't be an issue. This is especially important for slaving empires. Also, if you do need to do it, make sure that you unemploy the enforcer that has been generated when you upgrade the colony capital. And keep in mind that your crime should still be below 30%. As your initial empire expands and you bring the first two colonies into the fold, unless you specialize either of them in basic resources, which you probably don't need to do, that may in fact actually be overkill at this early stage, it is important to continue increasing the resource output and production of your capital. Keep building science labs, but it can also be a great idea to build the mineral or energy buildings like the energy grid or mineral purification plants. These buildings increase the base output of your miners or technicians, which then gets multiplied by all of the bonuses you're going to be getting on this world. You should also be using some of your excess district slots to build more mining and energy districts, but do keep in mind that you still need building slots as well, and you'll need to build city districts for that. If you do have the Prosperous Unification modifier on your capital, make sure that as you approach year 20 and the expiration date comes up for this, that you attempt to rebalance your amenities, as this Prosperous Unification is going to go away, reducing your happiness by 15% and your amenities by 25%. If you're not ready for it, this could be a crippling blow to the economy of your world and the economy of your nation. So making something like a hollow theater could be a very good idea around this time. As entertainers are a great source of amenities while producing a small amount of unity and having a low, low upkeep of only one consumer good. As you expand beyond your capital and your first two colonies, you'll now reach a unique situation where when you decide a planet's designation, what you should specialize it towards, you should really take into account the situation your empire is in at that present time and the resources available on the planet. For instance, this world has many mining districts available, so I'm going to specialize this world in being a mining world. And at this point, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of my channel members and patrons for their support. If you'd like to support this channel via Patreon or become a channel member, links to all of that are down in the description below. As the number of planets you have in your empire and thus candidates for specialization increase, you can do things to maximize your production and efficiency of each of your worlds. For example, this is the first colony I showed you quite a bit later in the future. This world has now been specialized specifically as only a forge world. And with that in mind, all of the pops on this world are all working towards a common goal, and that is the production of alloys alone. By specializing as a forge world rather than industrial world, this has shifted one of each of the consumer goods jobs into alloy production, meaning each of my industrial districts adds two metallurgist jobs and no artisan jobs. It also gives us a minus 20% to our upkeep, which reduces the mineral usage of each of these metallurgist workers. And then on top of that, we've tried to stack as many bonuses as we possibly can on the planet. Fully upgrading the building specific to alloys, in this case, the alloy nanoplant, increases our base alloy output from metallurgists. A Ministry of Production further increases the output by 15%, and in this case a building like a Psycore will give us telepaths, boosting our resources from job production, as well as our stability on the planet, yet further boosting resources from jobs. It also becomes a fantastic idea to build something like an orbital ring. Orbital rings have special buildings that, like buildings on the planet, will boost the base production of certain job types. You also shouldn't be afraid to slightly dip outside of your specialization if the empire needs it. For example, this empire definitely needed some volatile moats, 
rare crystals and exotic gases income in order to support these special buildings we wanted to build on our planets. For that reason, I put these buildings here on this research world. A majority of the pops are here still dedicated to research, but I've splashed a little bit into a few other things. There will also come a time where you actually run out of space for the chosen specialization that you've got. In this case, we have built every single mining district possible on the planet. We put the upgraded building down, as well as the upgraded orbital ring building but we still have additional district slots and additional building slots available. When you get to this point, it can be a good idea to add something where the designation bonus isn't that big a deal. In this case, I've decided to put down some strongholds and fortresses. These are provided soldiers, which are boosting the naval capacity of my empire and allowing me to build more ships. Another option you have available to you is to simply decide that this planet is finished and let any new pops that grow become unemployed. If we check over to the outliner here, you'll see there is a special icon for any unemployed pop that is currently migrating. In order for a pop to migrate, it must be first unemployed and it must have a destination available. A destination is a planet with a job that it can work that it's allowed to move to. You must also go to species rights and make sure that migration controls are disabled. This will allow the pops to actually move where they want. And now every month that passes, there is a chance that this unemployed pop will move to a different destination by hovering over it. And we can see a tooltip that tells us what that chance is and the most likely destination of migration. We can boost the chance of this pop moving by building things like the transit hub, which will give us plus 100% to the automatic resettling chance, as well as choosing the democratic government authority, giving an extra plus 50%. These have combined to give a 12% chance every month that this pop will actually migrate. And if we wait long enough, we will see it disappear. On the other hand, if you get this red symbol here, that means the unemployed pop has no possible location it can migrate to. This could, mean, this could be for a number of reasons. Either there are no jobs available anywhere in your empire, the pop specifically does not have the right to migrate, perhaps it is enslaved, it is a robot that cannot migrate, or you simply haven't given it the right to do so. Briefly covering what the other symbols here mean, the upgrade symbol here shows us that we have a planet where the capital is ready for being upgraded and the building symbol here shows us we have building slots available. Having available building slots is not a problem. In some cases, you may actually have no pops ready to work one of the building slot jobs. And if you have no unemployment, you've made sure to deprioritize and get rid of all of the clerk jobs or any other negative jobs you really don't want your pops to be working, then there is no need to preemptively build too many buildings. Having available jobs is pretty useless. Buildings with available jobs that are not being worked are simply using upkeep that should be spent elsewhere. But what do you think about planetary management? Do you have any further questions for me? If you do, let me know down in the comments section below. I will try to answer as many questions as I can if you ask them. The best type of specializations to have here are forge worlds, factory worlds, but you will probably only ever need one of these and you probably will be able to deal with spreading some consumer good production around your empire in the early game and therefore it won't be until the mid to late game you should really get one of these up and running. Tech worlds, complete with a research institute for bonus researcher output and a very helpful science director job. Mining worlds, complete with the tier 2 mineral purification hub and the low gravity mega refiner building for extra miner output. Generator worlds, complete with the tier 2 energy nexus building and the stratospheric ionization elements for maximum energy credit output from your technicians. Or an agri world, complete with a food processing center and a climate optimization station for maximum bonuses to your farmers. However, you should really try to avoid building a food or an agri world at all costs and instead use things like hydroponics bays and the market to maintain a positive food income. Generally speaking, the other designations can mainly be ignored. Unless you are really, really desperate for the extra unity, I would generally stray away from building a specific unity world 
But if you are going to build a Unity world, make sure to throw down the Unification Center, upgrade to the highest level of the culture building here for some basic extra Unity output as well as some raw production, and throw down an auto curating vault. Again, the Orbital Ring has a building specifically for this, and then there's the Orbital Filing System, which will increase the output of your bureaucrats, managers, priests, or telepaths. Basically, any of the Unity producing specialist jobs. If you manage to find a Gaia world, which gives you bonus happiness and bonus resources from jobs, you'll probably get the most benefit from this world by specializing it either as a unification center or instead as a tech world. On the other hand, for alloys or for consumer goods, you'll want to turn a world into an ecumenopolis. Now, this will produce a phenomenally large amount of alloys, as well as giving you massive housing and job capacity on this planet. Don't forget about the fact that your ecumenopolis can have administrative arcologies and has lots of building slots available if you want to throw down some researchers. Because an Ecumenopolis is even better than a Gaia world for providing bonus resources to jobs, and you can use it in a secondary capacity to increase both the number of bureaucrats or priest jobs in your society, and the unity production, or alternatively, research income. Something I haven't covered in this planetary management video is how to deal with rebellions, revolts, and uprisings. If you'd like to know how to squash your political adversaries and make sure you don't have splinter factions within your empire, click the video on screen now.